again. I've wanted to talk to you She's for ages, wonderful. so I'm very yeah, happy. I'm very lovely. happy to have this lovely. opportunity. I'm a big fan of everything you do, Susie. I've, I've followed you for quite some time now, and I'm, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in a nice, big, loud, booming voice for us, please, because we need your audio to be just a bit louder. Okay. Um, tell me, tell me, please, your journey of how you began to support or know about WikiLeaks and Julian all the way through until what led you to take a camera and a microphone and go to their embassy and do your part to inform the world about what's going on. Yeah, I, I always knew that I always knew that obviously power was corrupted and I sort of checked out of the whole thing for quite some time because you learn at an early age, oh well, democracy really it's all it's a bit of a scam and the MPs aren't really, you know, representing you. So I sort of checked out of it for a while and then I had an experience about 10 years ago that changed my life and changed the way I view things. And then about a year ago, I picked up a, a camera and a microphone and started yelling into it because I was quite angry at things. And then about, I think about three or four weeks ago, I got to the point where finally, thanks to crowd, um, crowdfunding and thanks to the tiny little bit of money I get from elsewhere, I could support myself. So I said, well, you know, I... I've noticed so much over the last year, Susie, how the media are not reporting on things like Julian Assange. And they're the things that are so important. They're the main point. You know, they're not talking about Julian Assange. They're not talking about the Integrity Initiative. They're not talking about the things that, are whole, that really show them to be the corrupt organizations that they are. Now, obviously, people like Julian Assange can expose that. And I've realized that um, I just did a, a video where I'm explaining how Julian Assange has taken the, the journalism from the, the analog era into the digital age and he's transferred it flawlessly. And the reason I believe that is because when I look at journalism, there are four fundamentals to it. You have to obviously gather information or be a source where people can give you that information anonymously. And then you have to obviously verify the information is true, release it if it is in the public interest, and there's no doubt that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks do that. And then fourth, and most importantly, and it goes back to number one, is actually protect your source. And this is why journalism is called the fourth estate. We are meant to hold them accountable. The, the people across the street from me have turned up like vultures. Unfortunately, they don't do it. So a few weeks ago, I asked my audience, I said, if you, if you want to invest £500 in me, I'll buy the equipment, I'll buy a camera, I'll come down and I'll cover it properly the way they're not. And um, yeah, they, uh, sorry, just some, something came up on the screen here. Um, yeah, no, um, I came down here, started covering it, and people have, uh, the outpouring of, 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 you know, gratitude for it has been almost overwhelming, to be quite honest. Well, it looks like you have some new fans. People are asking me the link to your details. <laughs> Great. Um, is there anything you want? Is there a preferred platform for them to contact you on? Um, well, you can get me at gordondimmock.com. That's my own personal website. The email is gordon at gordondimmock.com. And obviously, I'm on YouTube at Twitter as Gordon Dimmock as well. There's no fancy name or anything like that. It's just me. <laughs> I absolutely love the fact that anybody who cares cares to research for themselves and has a big heart and cares about other people and in this case Julian can take a camera and a microphone and can become the media um, it's what I learned to do in 2011 when media wouldn't cover the Occupy movement that's the only reason I ever became a journalist it was completely accidental it was out of the necessity to provide for ourselves coverage that the mainstream media were failing to provide for us. Um, how does it feel for you to go from, you know, just having this idea to now where I see you have been building a really established audience? Yeah, the, 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 the fan base I've got, the supporters I've got are really dedicated as well and they are really educated. And if ever I get something wrong, I know they're going to hold my feet to the fire and they're going to come down on me for it. And one of the people that I that sort of ex inspired me to do it the most is Jimmy Dore. And I know that you're obviously a big fan of Jimmy Dore, as yeah. most people in independent media are. He's a truth teller. He's, I call him the modern day George Carlin. Um, but he inspired to me. And what he says is, it's not difficult to actually do this better than those people across the street. All you've got to do is tell the truth. They don't do it. It's that simple. And they don't do it. So if you, I encourage people. I 
I came down here yesterday and there was a, there was a, a two guys who were setting up their own YouTube channel and they're getting involved and they're only just out of university. It's great to see. We are going to take back this fourth escape from them. We are. They will not win this. We will. I completely agree with you. And I, I said to Jimmy's face, actually, when I appeared on his show, that the proof is in the pudding. Jimmy Dore gets more hits on one of his videos than CNN gets on their official channel. In what they call the key demographic as well, which is what advertisers want. Absolutely. And I also told Jimmy that with the whole structure of oppression and censorship set against him, and all the algorithms boosting the mainstream yeah. media content, CNN content, he is still outperforming them. What does that tell us? If I've seen it as well. I mean, I, even though I'm a really, really small channel in, in comparison to, to some of these great people who've been doing it for doing it years, um, I, really, I, really, I really see that, see what you're talking about. So um, I've seen instances of, of myself is what I mean. I won't go into it too much, but they really you, do throttle you. They throttle you. It is not easy on YouTube. And I've, I've, I did an evaluation, actually, Susie, last year. I looked at, I've done a video on it. I looked at, do you remember the beginning of uh, 2018, the beginning of last year, YouTube changed their algorithm. Um, and you knew YouTubers had to go through a process to have their, to be monetized. Do you remember that? It was at the beginning. And at that point, um, People who were independent really struggled, whereas I noticed that CNN, MSNBC, and Fox, all of them doubled their tri and tripled in the case of MSNBCs, their traffic overnight to their YouTube channels. Imagine that. And yet the numbers are still dwindling. Those guys, nothing is going to is going to shorten up. going for them everything is going for them and they're still losing viewers and people like me have got everything going against them and we're on the rise so we're absolutely going to win this uh, win this absolutely and it's a trajectory um that's almost guaranteed i mean i've seen it across so many independent media people and i've even seen it happen with yourself as well i actually was watching your videos when you were like 100 views on a video and i've seen now how much further you are along from that and i re i remember with myself i remember writing my first big scoop on fbi and um operations in new zealand against kim.com and 600 people read it and I was like, wow, 600 people, this is amazing. You know, yeah. and now I, I wrote Being Julian Assange and 110,000 people read it. And at a certain point, you just, you don't realize it, it, but as you continue to do what you do, people are attracted to you like moths to flame and the size of your platform increases organically by word of mouth. And this is exactly the tra trajectory that you are on, Gordon. And I have no doubt that as you continue to do what you do, your platform will grow and grow exponentially as well. I, do, I, I really appreciate that. I'm really starting to see it snowball as well. That's what you start to talk about. It really does start to snowball. Um, and it, it's quite surreal in a way, especially for a guy who literally started doing this 12 months ago, started screaming to, into a camera from his council flat because he was a little bit pissed off one day. So I can see what you're talking about. And, it's really good to see, but um, it's, not, I'm, I'm not, it's not good to see it for me. It's not personal for me. It's just gratitude for me because I know more people are actually hearing the truth, and that's what it's all about. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than him behind us. It's all of us in it together actually fighting for the same cause, and that's humanity. You know, someone's just saying they really like writing and they're good at it but they would hate being read by hundreds of thousands of people. I just want to speak to that person and say, I hate cameras. I despise being Thank on cameras. You, anyone who follow yes, every anyone who follows me closely will see that there's like two press photos of me in five years because I hate, I don't take selfies. I don't like being on, on camera at all. For the first five years of my journalism, I interviewed um, people, all high-profile politicians, journalists, people all over New Zealand. I never, ever once put myself in the frame of the camera. I would always point the camera at them and be in the background. 
And what it really stuck with me is something that an activist said to me. It was when I was I was refusing to do well, this was during Occupy. I was refusing to do interviews. I was refusing to speak at events. I didn't want to be on a stage. I didn't want anyone looking at me. And they said to me, Susie, we need your voice. We need what you have to say. You have a responsibility to give that voice to the people. And that blew me away because that was when I realized, and this has stuck with me forever, it made me realize it's not about how I think I look in a camera or whether I like cameras or whatever, or whether I want my photograph taken. It's about the content of our speech. It is about the message that we have for people. And it is about showing people how important it is for us to stand up and to share that voice and share those messages. And we actually have to step out of ourselves for a minute. And we've got to deprioritize our own feelings and our own emotions and thoughts for a minute. And we have to prioritize getting that message out. And once I, once I got that, once I got that it's bigger than me and my hangups and my concerns or, or fears, once I got that, I was able to speak more and more and more. And I started actually speaking out more actively. Um, and then just in the, it's only been in the last few years, I think 2016 might've been the first time that I ever turned that camera lens on myself. And that was when I filmed my documentary, Diary of a Person of Interest. And what drove me to that was knowing that people needed to hear my story of what had happened to me and me being targeted. Yeah. And I needed to give that information to people. And that drive to share the information eventually surpasses your inhibitions about sharing it. So that person who was just saying in chat, they're good at writing, but scared of lots of people reading it put aside your fears and your thoughts about yourself and your identity and your person and think about the content of your words and your messages and how thirsty this planet is for that truth, that truth that Gordon was just talking about before, that people innately recognise it. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you, Sorosi, and Emily is, is pointing to me because somebody needs to come in and, and speak after me. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you, it really was. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope to speak again. And I would love to come on your channel anytime that you'll have me. Absolutely. You've got an open invite. We'll set that up. Peace, everyone. Thank we'll you. See you. see you. Come on, my friend. Here we go. <laughs> Introduce yourself to Susie. Thank you, Bob. Where's the camera? The camera's right oh, here. Yeah. We can see you fine. Oh, absolutely. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, my name's Chris Marsden. I'm the National Secretary of the Socialist Equality Party. In Britain, I'm here representing the World Socialist website. Uh, obviously, you know, in that that's in an official capacity. But why why we're taking part in this demonstration is because of the gravity of the situation. It's a very real threat now facing Julian. Uh, we reported today on the World Socialist website the remarks of the UN Rep Special Rapporteur on torture, uh, urging the uh, Ecuadorian government to not to carry out this threat and making very clear what was at stake. He said his uh, liberty is in danger, his right to free speech is in danger, and he faces uh, the possibility of cruel and unusual punishment and the United, he will be ex uh, extradited to the United States. So there's no, uh, th this is not um, a matter of conjecture. The United Nations is not a uh, body that comes to these conclusions without any substance. It's, a, it's not the first verdict that they've made uh, explaining the re very real uh, crimes that are being committed against Julian Assange. I mean, this is quite clearly the first great political crime of the 21st century. This is a man who has done more individually and through WikiLeaks to expose the criminal actions of imperialist governments all over the world, war crimes that have cost thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. He's done more to educate broad masses of the population in what's actually taking place, and that's why they're trying to get him. And this is, it, this is a really serious and grave moment for workers, young people, intellectuals, political figures, journalists, 
and it's and it it, it needs to be treated extremely seriously. Julian Assange should be defended by millions of people all over the world. But there's a, a cordon sanitaire being placed around him by the official media. He's being slandered and vilified. Lies are just da the daily bread of this thing. I'm looking across the street and there are journalists there who have been told to come. But it's like the uh, modern day equivalent of people knitting under the gallows. You know, they're here to see an, a public execution. They don't defend him. They're, they work for newspapers that are full of lies, deliberate lies, propaganda, all very carefully disseminated. And you have a situation now in which, while this is taking place, there's in, there are reports that the British government is working out some uh, careful scenario of how they're going to justify what they're doing, that they will, of course, extradite Julian Assange to the United States based on some promise that they won't execute him. Now, it's a worthless promise, as we all know, but what's the alternative? Decades in prison? This is, this is, this is modern-day justice? For what? For telling the truth. That's his only crime. And while this is taking place, we have no opposition to this being expressed in Parliament, not by Jeremy Corbyn, not by any senior figure in the Labour Party, not by the National Union of Journalists, not by countless uh, bodies who should be defending human rights. No, they're in discussion over how to resolve the Brexit crisis, having a chat about that. And we, th there's got to be uh, an urgent mobilisation of as broad a layers of workers and young people in opposition to this and in defence of Julian Assange. And that's what we're trying to uh, play our part, along with uh, people such as yourself, in doing. Well, I think you guys have been a relentless support for Julian, a relentless support and an international support. Um, we've had a, a few speakers from, we've had James Cogan, who's a National Secretary, obviously from Australia, onto the vigil to speak. Um, he's also participated in other events alongside myself and Christine Assange, which has been wonderful. Um, and we've had you guys there on the ground in Britain do amazing work. But I've also seen uh, Socialist Equality Party uh, and the World Socialist website has uh, been amplifying the voices of people in countries we wouldn't even necessarily think about who are supporting Julian Assange, actively supporting Julian Assange, such as Sri Lanka, I saw, and India and Pakistan. Can you tell us a little bit about those international efforts to organise in support of WikiLeaks? Well, well you, you tend to forget because of the relentless propaganda, but Julian Assange is seen as a hero by millions of people all over the world, and particularly in the oppressed and semi-colonial countries. These, these, are, these are masses of people who have some experience with imperialist crimes, with wars, with brutality, with uh, special rendition and all the rest. And so when we speak, you know, through our comrades in Sri Lanka to, the, to sections of workers, they are looking for a political lead on these questions. There is no doubt that there's the, this is the most extraordinary situation in political history. Julian Assange was recognised up until this campaign to get him as an international hero. And he's been subject while he's been in the embassy, but before, before to a, a, the most concerted campaign of vilification, lies, slander, persecution. And even despite that, if there was any major political party that would take a stand, they know they would get a major response. I mean, they're relying on confusion, disorientation, ignorance, all generated by the mass media in order to carry through something which will have devastating long-term implications for the working class. They want to make an example of Julian Assange, but it's an example to thousands of others, thousands of others. You know, what? if they can do this to him, that's, that, is, that is a scalp that they want to take. 
Absolutely. And then they'll cash in when they get the photo of him being dragged out in handcuffs, which is what most of those mainstream media people there are looking for. They will stand there for hours and hours so they can get the photo that they can sell for half a million dollars. And that's a thought that never leaves my mind. And then the, on the other side of that are the Gordon Dimmicks who are down there on pennies and pounds, you know, relentlessly fighting and putting themselves on the line. Um, for the truth, in service of the truth, which is the ultimate homage to Julian and to WikiLeaks, yeah. because Julian is someone whose physical body is on the line. Now, this is a point I made yesterday to someone on Twitter who said to me, we shouldn't lionize Julian as an individual. We shouldn't raise him up um, as an individual that we should just stick to the principles. And I said to them, well, the principles aren't being tortured for six years in that room. Julian's physical body is being tortured for six years inside that room. Uh, therefore, so long as it's his physical body, which is going to pay the price, I think that the principles obviously are very important, but we also have to respect the sacrifice of the individual. Well, Principles like history move through people. It's not an abstract concept. If, if principles aren't fought for, then they die. And Julian Assange doesn't need to be raised up. He's raised himself up by what he's done. But behind Julian Assange are people all over the world similarly committed to the principles of democracy, truth, justice, the, uh, the struggle to end oppression. And that's who... Uh, Julian Assange's audience is, that's where his defence comes from, and that's the, the pledge for the future of, of uh, humanity. You know, we're a, we're a socialist party, we fight to mobilise the working class as the revolutionary class in society. Uh, we see the defence of democratic rights as bound up with the struggle against capitalism and socialism. But we know that there is a broad mass opposition developing to the situation that is confronted by millions of people all over the world. And to those millions, Julian Assange is a symbol of the alternative. And these people across the road are uh, working as, as part of a political conspiracy against the, against the people of the world. The mainstream media organi organized and controlled by multi-billionaires whose sole purpose is to preserve the system which Julian Assange is a threat to. That's why their response is. And this is not about hero worship. This is about defending someone who is one of our own and who has played an extraordinary part in the development of a, of a new alternative political movement in the, uh, in the working class and the oppressed masses all over the world. We don't have political agreement with Julian Assange. We don't pretend to, but we know that he is someone who must be defended. This, this transcends any uh, issues of political difference. This is about the defense of the working class, the defense of progressive political thought from the, an attack by political reaction and by the major governments all over the world because they're all conspiring in this. All of them. Absolutely. Certainly any time that Julian has been asked about his own physical discomforts, he has said, what about the discomforts of those who are in Iraq? What about the discomforts of those who are in Syria? And he does keep a very firm grip on the relation between the information that he publishes and the real lives that are affected on the ground. Yeah. Absolutely. This is... Containing the fate of Julian Assange is the, is the fate of uh, struggling humanity. It, it can't be over, overstated. He has been targeted because he represents something which the powers that be are mortally afraid of and bitterly hostile towards. The struggle for a better world and for an end to oppression, uh, filthy wars, dirty crimes and everything that was exposed by WikiLeaks. And anyone that doesn't take that as their point of departure, all of the political tendencies that have ignored Julian Assange's fate or echoed the lies against him stand condemned by history, and they will stand condemned by the working class and millions of people all over the world. Something new will come out of this 
that is far healthier, more progressive, a genuine socialist and internationalist movement of the working class in the struggle for an end to oppression, uh, inequality and war. And it's That's ironic absolutely. to me, it's ironic to me that you are speaking those very true words with two surveillance cameras above your head and on from our side to the right of you, which is a very physical reminder of the 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 hardware of oppression um, that has been put all over London, all over the Western world, and that that which Julian and we are fighting against is ever present. Yeah. Well, obviously, the state has enormous powers. We're, we're as aware of that as you are. Every, anyone who takes a stand should, knows full well that they're tackling a beast. But we, we know something else as well, that despite that power, it rests on very insecure foundations because the real power in the world, yeah. and I think it was, it was demonstrated in 2003 with the protests against the Iraq war, yeah, million is, is millions and millions of people who are opposed to what is taking place. Now, if, there was, if there's a leadership that can mobilize that social force, then they can have as many surveillance cameras as they like. It won't save them. I completely agree with you. I think Julian is the greatest example of somebody who knew all of the risks, took them anyway, and changed the world as a result. And that's, that's the path that we all need to take. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Susie. I, I, thank I you so much. To speak to you. It was brilliant. Thank you so, so much. And goodbye to Emmy and Gordon and everyone doing an amazing job standing vigil over that Ecuadorian embassy in London. Well, you are deeply you appreciated. Wonderful job. I'll show around. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You've been brilliant, man. Yeah. Okay, and everybody, then, we're going to... Uh, hi, Emmy, you want to just say hi. goodbye to us? Hi, awesome. Liam, say goodbye, and I'm going to just to show you some of the people here. I'll try through the camera. Hopefully, you'll be able to see what we've got today. We have loads of lovely people coming from the Socialist Equality Party, but also seasoned... Uh, well, you can see Clara there. Hi. <laughs> We've got that is of fantastic. Just imagine how we are taking um, sort of uh, we're taking turns. Various of us coming through the day, and we will be here all through the day. And of course, I would like to show you. Um, Kieran is still, after all this time, all these days and months, holding vigil. He's still there, and he's doing the night time. And of course, behind us, we have still. Some members of the. Uh, wow, so there's still quite media. a bit of media there. So um, I would like to thank you very much for linking up, and I'm very grateful that we were able to carry on um, the broadcast from here. I'd like to thank Gordon and uh, Gordon Dimick and uh, also Chris Marsden from the Socialist Equality Party. Goodbye from us. They were, they were both wonderful, and so were you, Emmy. Thank you so, so much. And that was a great three, that was a fantastic 360 view of the Ecuadorian embassy. So thank you so much.